the Pope at war, an examination of what Pius XII did during the war before, during and to some extent after the war in a, in a, in a new book, uh, reviewed in the New York uh, Review of Books, The Pope at War. We're going to talk about that today here on ThinkTech, Global Connections, because it is global. It is about Europe, but it has implications everywhere. I'm Jay Fidel, the fellow who set this show up and introduced us to Brad Kerwin. is our old friend, Carl Ackerman. Hi, Carl. Welcome to the show. And Brad, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So um, and what's very interesting about this uh, article uh, in the New York Review of Books and elsewhere is that there were two books, uh, one that uh, criticized Pope, Pope uh, Pius XII, and the other one that said, no, he did a lot for the Jews during the war. Um, my, my own view of it up till now has been the Pope didn't do anything for the Jews during the, the war, and he could have. He could have, he could have made a statement, but he didn't. So I, I kind of agree with, um, what is it, Metzger. Um, and, um, you know, I, I take the position, and I've sort of come at this, um, you know, full disclosure, the position that the, the, the Pope didn't do the right thing. Um, but, you know, there are those who disagree, and it's a religious issue in part, or at least it's a church issue. And I wanted to get into it. Uh, Carl, how did you become aware of this book? And what does this book mean to you as a Jewish person? You know, um, I was able to see actually the author um, of this, uh, David Kurtzer, on um, American Jewish University, a podcast. Um, and so the, it became of great interest to me because I thought, number one, um, he was pretty fair in his appraisal of uh, Pope Pius XII. And also, I felt that um, this was a very interesting um, issue um, uh, concerning the, you know, the relative culpability of Pope Pius XII. Hmm. Okay, Brad, how did you become aware? I'm sure you were aware before Carl told you about it. Uh, and I, you have been raised Catholic, so you come at it from a different point of view, no? Yeah. Uh, yes. And, and for me, uh, for somebody who isn't, hasn't been raised Catholic, it's your point of view is going to be entirely different. Uh, I remember when Pope Pius XII died. It was in 1958. I was in second grade with Sister Rose Damien. I remember when he died. I remember when they uh, elected um, uh, Pope John the 23rd whom everybody adored and loved. And so people at that time were looking back, I think, already on Pope Pius. I mean, for young people, it's kind of like, so what did he do? Was he the, the world peace leader? And no, he was not. Um, it's, it's different for somebody who was raised that way, for, for, for sure. And um, I'm, he could have done a bunch of stuff to help uh, everybody, not just the Jews, but uh, a lot of other different people. One of the wait, one of the things, Jay, that just just hit me about um, Hessman's book was when they got to the point where he said, um, when the Allies uh, got into Sicily, and because he was not supporting the Allies at all, and when they did get onto the mainland, that he, the Pope. Um, said that he didn't want any, uh, when they got to the Vatican, he didn't want any servicemen who were colored to be, uh, who were colored to be stationed at the Vatican. That kind of pretty much told me what kind of person he was. Uh, yeah, and where the church was. I mean, you have to look at the church through him. He was uh, calling the shots for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, and I think, you know, it, 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 it asks us, you know, what was going on with the Vatican and with its relations in general with other countries in Europe before, during, and after the war. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my, my reaction to that is the Vatican was really, it felt itself was pretty lucky because after the consolidation of Italy in 1870, there followed a period of negotiation. Uh, finally ending up in the um, an agreement for the sovereignty of the Vatican as Vatican City, a separate sovereignty within Italy. Quite remarkable. Yep. And I'm sure that every pope said to himself, hmm, this is good. Uh, I really want to hold on to this. And if I don't play my, my cards right, 
my geopolitical cards right. If I, if I, for example, get into an argument with Mussolini, next thing you know, I lose the Vatican. So there were, you know, practical issues that that covered this. The other thing, of course, and it's revealed um, in the movie that's become popular lately, although it was made in 1972, and it was a remake of a movie done in 1950 or so, uh, called The Garden of the Finzi Contini. It's a very, very interesting movie, and it was about being Jewish and wealthy in a town called Ferrara near Rome uh, in the 1939, 1940. Uh, and you could see it closing in um, on the, this, this Jewish family, and they didn't realize it. You know, and I think that we, when we look at Europe in the spirit of time, we have to realize that people did not know necessarily. Nobody knew for sure what the Pope was doing or not doing. They were, they were following signals. Um, and uh, Mussolini was capitalizing on the very Catholic quality of the country. Um, but suffice to say, one day you couldn't drive a car um, and you had to drive a bicycle. Next day you had to, you had to give up your bicycle. Um, next day you had to wear a Jewish star. Um, yep. Next day they came for you. And, and, that's, and that's what happened in the Garden of the Vinci Continued. These people who, who lived the sweet life with tennis courts and swimming pools, one day um, they came for everybody in the family, three, four generations, all picked up, all at the same time, all astounded, uh, you know, that their wealth and their political power, their previous political power, uh, could be disregarded that way. And yet that's what happened in Italy, Catholic country. Um, so, I, I mean, we have to look at Europe in general, don't we, Carl? Yeah, you know, Jay, you were quite eloquent in talking about, you know, the um, Risorgimento or, you know, the Italian unification, because, you know, by 1870, the Pope didn't have anything. Um, and that's because um, Napoleon III had protected, you know, during the early parts of Italian unification, uh, the Pope and the Vatican. But when they, when he eventually lost uh, to the Germans with German unification, you know, um, and Napoleon III actually uh, was, to, was, was going to protect, um, you know, the, the Vatican, but no longer because, you know, Bismarck was in charge, the Kaiser was in charge, you know, and, uh, and, and so, um, you know, he, uh, the, the Vatican had to go through a process of reestablishing itself. And I, I think early in the 20th century, if I'm not wrong, um, there was a you know, little area carved out, which is Vatican City. And if you, know, if you go to Europe, and uh, I think uh, uh, I know Brad's boys, uh, Brad's sons, and I, I know my daughters really enjoyed going to Vatican City because you could get your own stamp, but it's its own country. And so that's, that's just wonderful. But um, going back to um, the article by Tim Parks, who's you know, a specialist on Italy, and I've read a lot of his things, and only because I had a wonderful colleague named Christopher Strawn when I taught at Iolani School, a wonderful, wonderful school. Um, and uh, he, he said, you got to read this guy, Tim Parks, who knows a lot about Italy. So he's the guy that wrote the article. Um, and the way he begins it, and I think it's worth quoting, he says, should outrage and atrocity always be denounced, whatever the consequences? And will the answer be the same for a private individual a political leader and a spiritual leader, and I would go further and say an institutional leader. And clearly in the first three categories, Pius XII failed miserably. Um, you know, there's no question about his morality. And as, as um, uh, Dr. Kerwin pointed out, you know, he didn't want African-Americans in, in, in the Vatican. You know, so, you know, that tells you where his minds were at. And of course he was getting advice by cardinals who were particularly anti-Semitic at the time. But, and, but, uh, but remember, as I, that's why I suggested we have to look at Europe in general. For that matter, we have to look at the U.S. in general. The 30s was a time of, of bigotry, of moving to the right, of uh, autocracy, uh, reflected ultimately in Hitler and Mussolini and probably Stalin in the same category. Um, and, and so what we have is uh, everybody's being bigoted against everybody. In this country, we had Father Coughlin, by the way. Who was Catholic, and whose, uh, whose whose followers were Catholic too, I might add. So uh, you know, we had in in the 1930s, everywhere in the world was going to bigotry. So when the Pope said he didn't want you know African American soldiers there, he was reflecting 
a very wide swath of public opinion. Yeah. It wasn't just him. Yeah, there, you're, you know, the, that's very true. And, and of course, there were huge rallies at Madison Square Garden um, led by Nazis, you know, just before World War II. And, you know, thank, thank God for Rabbi Stephen Weiss, who led sort of counter, uh, counter movement, you know, um, of Reform Judaism and other people, et cetera, et cetera. So um, no question about it. And I, I just sent um, um, friends of mine an article about the anti-Semitism at Stanford that, that curtailed uh, Jewish enrollment in, in the 50s, not that long ago, really. Oh, and, and, now and now they're apologizing for it. And they're apologizing for it, which is to their credit. But I mean, it was from Fairfax High School and Beverly Hills High School, high schools that Brad and I know well. Uh, because we we had we had we had we grew up in that area, and it wasn't you know we grew up in the in the in the seventies, and so it wasn't that far away. But anyway, you're absolutely right, Jay. And uh, the only thing I would say is, and I want to let you know, um, hand it over to Brad and his commentary about um, Pius the Twelfth. But is that at every point when Pius the Twelfth could have made a comment and could have talked about, because we weren't talking about just prejudice, we were talking the mass extermination by policy. Well, are you country. saying are you saying, Carl, that it was obvious that Pius XII knew what was going on in Germany and the and the countries that were occupied by Germany? I don't think there's any question. Um, um, after I would say, I'm not sure he knew um, before. You know, um, actually, Hitler came up with the final solution, but he certainly knew after that. Um, um, and for him not to have, I mean, uh, um, Dr. Kerwin and I discussed this uh, recently, and that was. That you know there was a thousand, according to this article by Tim Parks, there was a thousand Jews who were captives in Italy later in the war. Who yes. he knew all about it, and he let them get on the trains. And of that, a thousand plus, like fourteen lived. Um, so you know his moral authority. Uh, I, think, I think it's a very important point to note that Hitler was expanding his territory in the late thirties, the early forties, and he controlled a lot of countries. And as he expanded the territory, he expanded his anti-Semitism. And so Kristallnacht was not just in Germany. It was all over Europe. It was a huge and public plan. So if you were observing, whether you were the Pope or not, what was going on in Europe, if you were half awake in Europe, if you read any newspaper at all in Europe in those days, you knew that Hitler was onto the Jews and he was going to do something. You may not, as you said, you may not have known as Pope uh, that the final solution was about to happen, but you did know the anti-Semitism was rife wherever Hitler went. So Brad, you know, you, you are Catholic, you raised Catholic. There are two books reviewed in this New York Review of Books story. Um, and one of them is a, an earlier book, 2018, just a few years ago, by somebody who was working inside the Vatican. Uh, and I don't, I don't think it's a quote, but close to say that uh, this book stands for the proposition that this Pope, Pope Pius XII, did more than anyone else to protect the Jews. And that is 180 different from the book we're, we're looking at today, The Silence of the Pope, which yeah. is the one that was primarily in the review. How do you come out on that? Which side of it do you fall on? What are your feelings about it emotionally and from a religious point of view? It, it's hard for me because it, it, what makes this really difficult, because they, they brought it up inside the article, was talking about even back then, Hitler is, is, is asserting that, you know, he's got all kinds of stuff about all the abuses that the priests were uh, visiting upon, uh, upon children, about uh, women, uh, women, boys and girls, and that he was, he could let loose with that stuff anytime he wanted to, uh, which means it's gone back, that goes back further and further. This man ends up, that author ends up being an apologist for things that did and didn't happen. Um, the fact that all of the uh, all of the documents that had anything to do with abuses by priests and stuff before before that it happened then and before were all to be burned so that no one would ever know about any of that stuff. So uh, the person taking the side of the Pope, I, I understand wanting to try to keep the institution. If I'm in charge of the institution, I understand wanting to do that. The fact that it last, lacked any kind of moral consistency um, uh, and that he was skating around through different things is pointed out repeatedly. And uh, I knew about from a young age, probably from the time I first started at UCLA, it's like, well, do you know what the Pope did? 
you know, he was basically just kind of like, he was not taking a stand. Uh, and, I, and on the other hand, there's the, the whole idea that, did he not look and see, do you understand what's gonna happen if the Nazis do take over? They're incredibly anti-Catholic. <laughs> In the end, you're going to be in a horrible, horrible shape. If, if, do, you, do you agree that uh, that Europe and, in large part, um, Catholicism in Europe, which at least at the time was a, a dominant religion in Europe, has experienced, has, has had within it uh, a, a thread of anti-Semitism from way, way back in the early days of Catholicism. And, and when you look at the development of Europe and the development of anti-Semitism, and the development of the church, you see this as a contention that started very, very shortly after the birth and death of Christ. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. And yes to all of that. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, I, as someone, again, raised Catholic, you, you look at this and you go, well, you know, you're, you Christians, you Catholics, you're the, you're the, you killed Jesus. Jesus was killed either, no matter how you look at it, either by the other Jews or by the Romans or both, there were no Christians, there were no Catholics. Um, Jesus, who, and I, I'm sorry, I, I started studying religion really heavily, and it might have been you, Carl, who pointed out to me, goes, Brad, there was nobody named Jesus. Pardon me? <laughs> there was nobody named Jesus. What do you mean? Don't you look at, okay, I don't agree with everything, Carl, but so just, no, Brad, there's no J sound in, in ah. Hebrew. <laughs> so there's no Jesus, there's no John, there's no jo Joseph, there's no Jacob. That person was probably named Yeshua or something like that, which was probably like Joshua or Yashua. Yeah. I'm kind of going, well, yeah, sorry. But for me, we're all into this together. Me and me and my Old Testament brother, we should be taking care of each other, and that's what bothers me. Is because I don't think the Pope took care of people. Well, but, you know, one thing to be bothered by is this: uh, the two books. Let me ex express them. One is the Pope at War: The Secret History of Pius the Twelfth, Mussolini, and Hitler by David Kurtzer, and the other book, also mentioned in this New York Review of Books uh, review, is the Pope and the Holocaust. See how uncharged that is, that is a very flat statement of the subject. Um, Pius XII and the Vatican Secret Archives by Michael Hesseman. Um, and it was written in German, by the way. Uh, what's interesting, I think, is that he was writing it for the Vatican. He was inside the Vatican, and I, I guess this is a Vatican book. And what, what troubles me is that, hey, it's pretty clear. Um, you know, if somebody says something, that's a matter of record. But if somebody says nothing, that's just as clear, if not clearer. <laughs> and the Pope didn't say anything. He didn't say anything to Hitler. He didn't say anything to Mussolini. And he didn't say anything to Europe and the public and, and this country where no. he could have. And so what you, know, what you have is a, a very clear dichotomy between the two books. And one of them, by its nature, is much more credible than the other. But what, what troubles me is that the Vatican, if you ask them today, Carl, um, what their view of this was, they would say, well, uh, we like um, Michael uh, Hesseman's book. It's the correct statement because it was written in, you know, by them, for them, and all that. And that's a cover-up. That's a cover-up of the silence, isn't it, Carl? Well, you know, here's the, you know, the, the argument that Hesseman makes is simply that there was no other choice, and you know, yes. in a sense, in a sense that Kurtzer, um, you know, David Kurtzer, um, um, when he was ending his speech for American Jewish University, said this. They asked him a question about whether the Pope did what was correct for the institution, as Brad identified um, earlier in this talk. And you know, you can say. Um, you know, if you are a um, real politic follower of Otto von Bismarck, um, that indeed um, the Pope was aiming at saving um, the Catholic Church as an institution. The question is, and this is the this is the million dollar question, not even the thousand dollar question, but the million dollar question is, 
at what price? And so if you, if you think of the Pope as a spiritual leader and as someone who has to make um, decisions that are not just based on um, 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 a state, but based on some sort of moral dimension, then he failed miserably. But I don't think a case can be made that he failed as an institutional leader. I think that he um, had choices to make, but here's the, here's the, here's the, even as an institutional leader, here's the historical problem. When you have a Adolf Hitler, a Benito Mussolini, or a Joseph Stalin, you can't have two gods. You can't have the Catholic Church and the leader of the Nazi party, the leader of the fascist party in Italy, and the leader of the former Soviet Union. So eventually, I think, had the Nazis been um, successful, they would have tried to eliminate the Catholic Church because you can't pay obedience to two gods. Mm, um, well, and, okay. And so uh, I, so you're, you're, you're lining up the reasons why uh, it was important for the Pope to say nothing and let it happen. And let, even, you know, even if you don't, you don't say that he was stood by for 6 million um, deaths, uh, in 1942 or so, it was already clear in the newspapers that there were at least 2 million deaths. In the United States, it was clear, or maybe 4 million. Um, what's the difference, really? I mean, it's huge. And he knew this. He had to know this as an informed person. So he stood by for that. Now, you can say that, well, there are reasons why he didn't want to lose the church. The church was more important than the moral compass here. Um, however, that wasn't my question. I want to pose my question to Brad. Even assuming there were reasons for the Pope to remain silent, and they were good reasons for the protection of the church, even assuming that, what we have since then is tantamount to a denial of the reality, to a cover-up, right? Yes, I think so. Because, because in the end, a bunch of the things that he did, and Carl, you and I have talked about this, on, because you have to look at them regardless of... If the institution fails or it doesn't, what are you doing in terms of since you are a Catholic and you believe in Jesus and you believe in God, where do you stand morally, ethically? What about, what about, and, and, and yet, what's his name? The one author, the one pro person. Well, yeah, he tried to get visas for the kids to go to Brazil and he did it again and again and again, and they just weren't able to have those 3,000 visas. Uh, well, okay. I, that's, that's a thing, but it still doesn't come down to, yes, he was afraid that the institution was going to fail. It was going to be his fault. Uh, and a bunch of the stuff he did, as far as I'm concerned, was uh, self-serving, institution-serving, and yet immoral. I, I, yeah, I agree can, with can you. you oh, I was going to ask you if you agree with that, Carl, because I think he put you on the spot. No, I, I, Jay, no, he doesn't put me on the spot, because if you listen to what I had said carefully earlier, is that there are four different categories. And if you, if, you, if you talk about the Pope as a moral, spiritual leader, he failed miserably. And there's no question about that. But I was struck by David Kurtzer's answer to this question about the, uh, whether he failed as an institutional leader. And Kurtzer could not answer that question. He was ambivalent, which I am also yeah. ambivalent about if you just examine the, the Pope as a leader of an institution. But what my, my point is, is that um, you can't justify anything the Pope did. He basically, as a, from a moral point of view, as from an individual point of view, and from a spiritual point of view, but if you take the tack as, um, as Heisman has done, um, which is that he is akin to any other political leader, um, which, and by the way, political leaders were doing this all across the um, world, including the United States, refusing ships from coming in with, um, with yeah. refugee Jews, that, that he was acting the way Otto von Bismarck acted in terms of real politique. And it was horrible. And, um, and uh, you know, you can't justify the Pope's actions. But if you look at it only from the institutional preserving church as the leader of the church, the way you would have a leader of another country, then in some respects, you have to say there is that possibility that you could have a monograph that comes out with, you know, the way that, um, that Heisman did. Having said that, it's interesting to note, 
um, as uh, Tim Parks points out, is that the Jews that were allowed to get visas were Jews that had converted to Catholicism. So overall, Jay, I mean, I, I understand your, your righteous indignation, and it is righteous indignation. The Pope, was, the Pope was horrible during World War II, but you have to, from a historical position, you know, and I'm a historian, you have to see what the questions are being asked. And Heisman asks a question that I think is an incorrect question about the, moral, the, the culpability of the Pope, but he is looking only at the Pope as an institutional leader. Well, if you want to get inside the Pope's mind and see the distinction between being Catholic, reading the Bible, you know, finding the moral path and all that, um, of course, uh, and, the, and, and a, a good Catholic person would never have stood by knowing that millions of people were being slaughtered. slaughtered. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that could ever in the world justify any of that. Uh, in fact, it would all speak, it would, it would yell. Uh, it, it would not be silent in any way. Now, when you, when you say, well, the Pope actually was trying to do the best thing, the practical solution to protect the church, that assumes there's a distinction between a good Catholic and a good church, that you can actually divide them. Um, and this is very problematic. If I were a Catholic, I would say, what, are you kidding me? Um, you, 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 there's a separate morality, a separate morality for the good Catholic and the good church. I wouldn't be able to accept that. Brad, comments? I, I agree with what Carl said, though. He, the, he ended up trying to protect the, the institution, and the institution is still here. Uh, and he could have lost it a whole bunch of different ways. It could have gone down the tubes. The Nazis could have won. Um, he could have come out really strongly against everything that was going on and they could have been shut down and he could have been killed, which is another possibility. So, All true. You think those things would have happened historically? The, the oh. interesting thing, um, uh, both Brad and Jay, is that in the article itself, it talked about how the Pope was, um, didn't want to fragment the Catholic support because had he come out against yeah. Hitler, he was afraid of you know, dividing Catholics in Germany, which he thought, uh, uh, and I think quite correctly that he would have lost the battle uh, because people were so mesmerized by, by, um, uh, by Adolf Hitler. Now, the, the issue is- uh, Are you saying that the Catholics in Germany were supporting Hitler? Yes, I am. And, 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 and not to the same extent, I think, and this is what Tim Parks points out also as the Protestants did, but I think there was, you know, it's difficult to understand, and you know, having lived in the former Soviet Union, the, the power of the media and the power of a totalitarian state when things are coming at you. And I think there were um, many, many good Catholics, including Oskar Schindler, um, who did, you know, did what they could in terms of trying to save Jews uh, during the war. But you, know, you, can't, you can't defend the Pope on a spiritual basis, on a moral basis, and on an individual basis. You can't. It, it, it's horrible. Uh, but what Heisman is trying to do is defend him um, institutionally. And your point, Jay, is a good one, is can you separate the institutional um, uh, wanting of saving um, the Catholic Church from uh, the moral duty? Um, is that possible? But, uh, and what I pointed out is you can only support what the Pope did if you're taking a huge um, uh, real politic position um, that he was able to, to save the church and um, perhaps not. And remember that, you know, from a historian's point of view, no one knew in 1941, 1942, who was going to, much less 1939, who was going to win this war. And so the Pope had a lot of things to um, consider. But, you know, as you pointed out, Jay, there, you know, it was an anti Semitic era anyway. And the Pope had to make certain decisions. But from a historian's point of view, I can see the Heisman position. Um, I don't agree with it. Um, you know, uh, the other position is much more attractive to me. Um, but as, as I go back to David Kurtzer, when David Kurtzer was asked that question about whether the Pope did a good job for the Catholic Church as an institution, he was ambivalent. And, and so am I. Um, because, you know, and from the other three positions, it was absolutely horrendous. But, you know, it's, it, it's tough being a historian and being a person. 
<laughs> well, if I if I give you syllogistically, you know, a country which has a substantial number of Jews in it, uh, who are waiting for a direction from Pius the Twelfth, and the direction they get is silence during the war, and little by little they become aware of the fact that Jews are being murdered in huge numbers. Uh, okay, and then the war ends. And I agree with you. Nobody knew at the time how it was going to work out. It, it could have been any kind of ending, including a you know, most horrible imaginable ending. It was horrible and imagine, unimaginable anyway. Um, and then I, I turn back, and I am now a child of the war. Um, and there are many families in Germany right now today, we, we know some of them, who are children of the war. Um, how do they think of the church and its performance during the war? Because all this has been made clear to them, one way or the other. How do they think now of the church? Has this strengthened the church in the eyes of those Catholics? What do you think, Brad? I, I, I don't know, Jay. I, 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 in terms of this particular uh, issue um, and World War II and the Holocaust, um, so much of the stuff and my relationship with the church and Catholicism is colored by uh, everything that keeps coming out about my family's religion that goes back forever in Ireland uh, of the Catholic church filled with abusive people doing horrible things, not in any one particular place, but everywhere. So it's colored by all, it's colored by all of that. Those are the kind of things that uh, rise to the surface when people talk to me and, and ask me about uh, being Catholic. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of the yeah. provision in the First Amendment in the U.S. Constitution, to the U.S. Constitution, which, which uh, makes it clear that the, the, the state shall not establish a religious separation of church and state. Yeah. And, and I think there was probably a lot of good reason that that, that was written down. Uh, you know, we just as you say, the church had not done a very good job at, at promoting, um, you know, justice uh, among groups in the society. It had been cruel in so many ways. Um, it had not been helpful, even by its own, its own, you know, stated morality, biblical morality. And so these guys back in in the late 18th century, they said, "Let's keep them apart. We don't want the church running politics." Um, because it'll yeah. get us in trouble. We have had enough experience in Western civilization to know it's a bad idea. And yet, okay, it still exists today. Uh, and maybe all of this discussion between you, Brad, and Carl and me is really about the separation of church and state. If the Pope had said, look, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't get involved, that's political, I would feel better about him. He didn't say that, uh, no. and he made he made no effort to make that clear. Um, so uh, you know, I'm thinking that um, that really we're talking about this this kind of corruption that happens when you when you assume um, that the church, a religious organization, has influence in a non-religious society. Carl, what do you think? Yeah, you know, and, and you and Brad, first of all, before we end today, I just want to say what a pleasure it is uh, with these two, two fellow mentions uh, working together. But um, I, I, would, I would agree with you. And one of the things, Jay, that I want to conclude with is that, you know, people who study European history, if you don't understand the Catholic Church, you're not going to get very far in European history. Um, uh, because it wasn't until the Enlightenment um, that things changed. And of course, for Jewish people, the Enlightenment was a godsend. And, you know, it was people like Napoleon that freed people from the ghettos, you know, because he was an enlightened thinker to a certain extent, um, a dictator in other areas. But um, so uh, the Enlightenment really helped out. And, of course, our forefathers were Enlightenment thinkers. And so um, it's, 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 it's what you're talking about, the First Amendment, is it's coming right out of the Enlightenment. I, I completely agree, we agree with you. Thank God for people like Benjamin Franklin, who was truly a man of, uh, of, of, of the Enlightenment, but I don't want to end um, this discussion about Catholicism without making a point that the tremendous work that Jesuits have done, and especially around the world, 
of what the Catholic Church has done for the poor and the needy. And um, I, 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 Jay, I had sent both you and, um, and Brad this, this comment that on my nightstand is a picture of Mother Teresa um, in that regard, because I had a very good friend who was a nun um, who worked with her in India. And so there are many good things about the Catholic Church. And um, uh, of course, just to conclude, but of course, Pius XII is not one of them. If I can go back to those uh, popes way back when, you know, when the, the papacy was first being developed, uh, even in Perpignan, way back when, mm -hmm. uh -huh. I would say to them, good, but not good enough. I want you guys to do more. I don't want there to be any corruption. I don't want there to be any weakness. You have to follow your own principles absolutely and with everyone. You have the power, use it properly. And I'm afraid to say that, although I certainly agree with Carl, the church has done a lot in some ways, it has not done enough. And it certainly didn't do enough during World War II. Uh, so let's go to closing comments, Brad. What are your what are your closing comments? How would you integrate all this discussion? And what message would you leave with our viewership? I, I don't want anyone who listens to this or any of my friends to think that I don't have a, a great deal of love for Catholicism as an approach or my friends who are Catholics, I, I, I wouldn't want them to be angry at me just because I'm not taking a position that uh, they like. Because there's a lot of really good people who are Catholics. There are a lot of really good priests and nuns whom I worked with. The thing that I have difficulty with, with the Pope and with it, is that they're just people and they make mistakes. And unfortunately, if you're in a power of real position, you can make heavy duty mis mistakes. And a lot of Catholics have, and a lot of people who are Catholics and in charge have made them. He made them, and that makes me unhappy. And it makes me unhappy because this is my religion, um, or it was. Now I'm just if, a student. If you could go back to him now, the inception of his papacy, what would you tell him? I just had something that was scattered with obscenities run through my head just now, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, but wake the heck up. Uh, take care of people and not the institution. Start taking care of the people and everybody, not just the people who are like on your team. You know, it's like everybody. Jesus, you believe in Jesus? Jesus was for everybody. For everybody. And you need to be for everybody. Vicar of Christ, you represent him. Do it. That's wonderful, Brad. So, Carl, now your turn to see if you can summarize and, and uh, create a message, express a message to our viewership about this discussion. You know, my message um, will be kind of an academic one, and I think they should read the article by Tim Parks that, that Think Tech, mm -hmm. Tech has, uh, you know, elucidated and, and put on their website, because I think it's a very thoughtful article about um, Pius XII. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard if you're Jewish um, to come to any other conclusion about um, Pius XII not saying anything. Uh, among many other leaders, he's not alone. Oh, yeah, um, there's a whole study of that in Ken Burns' uh, movie. Uh, and recent recent documentary, the U.S. and the Holocaust, a whole study of seen, how that worked in the U.S. And um, I haven't seen that, and I, I want to see that. But I mean, been. it's very difficult. And I before I came on, I was wondering, you know, about people who, you know, you know, that are, you know, the sons and daughters of Holocaust survivors. And, you know, it's 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 a difficult, difficult thing that we approach today. And uh, my net conclusion is that uh, Pius XII, that had I had the same opportunity as my good friend, Dr. Brad Kerwin had, um, I would say to him, you have to make the moral call. You're a Catholic leader. You're not just a leader, you're a Catholic leader. And you have to be um, someone who preserves life and the life of the innocent and the life of people who have been brutalized. And I would make the same argument to those people who are watching Ukraine today and not taking a stand. 
um, because it's you know it's it's not as it's not a clear policy. It's not comparable in many ways to the Holocaust. But it's again leaders not coming up and taking a stand. Yeah. Mm. And I would say to him, you know, the, the New Testament is, is a progeny of the old. And there's much to be learned, um, you know, from the Jewish way of looking at things. And uh, you, you should look and see what the Old Testament was saying. And you should do mitzvah. That's another Latin word, right? <laughs> you should do good deeds, affirmatively. Good deeds. That's what I would say. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Brad Kerwin, Carl Ackerman. Thank you. This has been a wonderful discussion. I really appreciate it. And I, uh, with you, I recommend uh, everyone take a look at this article in the. Thank uh, you, Brad and Jay. Two Menches. <laughs> Same here. Thank, thank you, my Menches. Brad. Two <laughs> Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.